All right, welcome back to The Real Story, everybody. Our next guest leads the Senate Republicans. We want to get right to it and welcome in State Senator Republican uh, Len Fasano. Len, it's always great to talk to you. Thanks so much for being here. Matt, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. So let's start with this. Uh, last fiscal year, Eversource reported gross revenue of $909 million. Uh, Connecticut residents have certainly contributed to a portion of that, and so has the state. The governor has said that he has not seen much progress as far as modernizing the grid goes. How culpable do you believe the utility companies are for these outages that we've seen? Well, you know, I think they are culpable. They're the, they're the monopoly. They're the ones who come to us with all this um, uh, reasons for adding to the uh, rate increase, and they're talking about the infrastructure that is required to make sure we have, uh, we can uh, survive storms or have a rapid response. And time after time, uh, they have failed. They haven't learned from Irene. They didn't learn from Sandy. They didn't learn from the Halloween storm. Uh, and every time they have an excuse for one reason or, or the other. I think they owe the ratepayers in the state of Connecticut an explanation. I think uh, the attorney general should think about bringing a monetary lawsuit with the money going back to the ratepayers uh, for uh, damages um, in terms of relief. If they can't uphold the end of their bargain, they need to return the money that they claim they needed to not have a problem after a storm. There's no reason three or four or five days after a storm, people should still be without power. Yeah, Senator, you know, I'm just curious about this. There is a member of your own caucus, Senator uh, Kevin Whitkos, who does work for Eversource in community relations. Have you spoken to him about the response? I haven't spoken to him recently. Look, Kevin is an employee. His job is to keep the water smooth and be the voice between Eversource and the people. That's his job, and that's what he's done. He's done a great job at doing that. But he can't force management to do something they don't want to do. He's not the one who's making the management plan. He's not the one who uh, is saying how to invest the money. He's the one who's like the consumer report guy, the guy who gets the calls about the problems uh, on real time, and that's what he's doing. And he's trying to uh, get the people, the crew to the areas, just like it's not the crew's fault either. This is a management problem. These are the people who make these decisions. Uh, that's their problem. Kevin's doing a great job to be the voice of reason yeah. to try to get people where they're needed. But if management doesn't invest and doesn't deploy people in the right area, there isn't much Kevin could do about it. Yeah, and, you know, companies are certainly made up of workers and employees, those frontline people, and they are working around the clock, as you mentioned, to restore power. Uh, I wanted to ask you, there's also the issue of those high utility bills. Eversource did say that the increases that people saw were largely a result of legislation, Senator, that was put into place last year when these electric providers were instructed to buy power from the Millstone Power Plant. Uh, possibly at a higher rate. Um, so isn't this partially the fault of lawmakers? No, not really. I think that the people who have made those statements are people who don't know or haven't read the law and weren't in the room or uh, know the real background. Truth of the matter is, in 2017, we passed a bill that allowed us to have the communication and allow Millstone to be part of a group that we had to buy power from. So here's the deal. And people don't want to talk about this who are out there throwing boulders and rocks. Um, here's the issue. The issue is Connecticut is at the end of the pipeline. We can't get enough natural gas. We try to get it out of New York. New York won't let us get the gas line here. We try to get the uh, hydroelectricity out of Massachusetts. Massachusetts said no. So the question is, if we don't have those two sources, where are we going to get power? How are you going to keep the lights on? The answer was, we have to look at nuclear. It is the cheapest of the remaining fuel sources available. Wind, solar, all that stuff that people talk about, the green people want and everything, that's very, very expensive stuff. So we went with uh, an energy source that was less expensive. That was Millstone. The bottom line is, but for having the deal for, with Millstone, our rates would have been exorbitant. The rates went up very, very little okay. because of Millstone. It's other issues. All right, I want to move along now. A special session just wrapped up recently. Uh, the main bill of contention there, that police accountability bill, Republicans <clears throat> mainly disagreeing with the provision to strip officers of qualified immunity. But isn't that issue really a federal issue anyway? 
No, it's a state issue. What the Democrats did, and they'll run from it, and they're running from it now, frankly, is this allowed a state cause of action under state law for the first time to be brought up against a police officer in Connecticut. So before, it was a federal constitutional right issue called 1983, but it's a federal constitutional right issue. And there's safeguards. If you bring a frivolous case against a police officer, you have trouble if you're the plaintiff or the lawyer, frankly, for bringing it. What the Democrats did is strip that law away and say, we're going to write our own law to bring a new cause of action in the state of Connecticut the first time. And oh, by the way, we're going to make the level very, very low. And by the way, if a frivolous action is brought, uh, it's brought no big deal. That's what they did in the law. So good police officers are going to get sued as well as bad police officers are going to get sued. But predominantly, everyone agrees, 99% of the officers are good people. They're going to get sued if they, if someone believes that they infringed on their constitutional right, told them they had to have a permit to demonstrate in a park, um, saw something and said, listen, what are you doing on the corner? Uh, whatever the issue is, they are going to get sued, no question about it. And under federal law, it probably right. would have been tossed out. Under state law, it is going to continue. There are going to be a lot more suits, lawsuits, and there are going to be a lot of police officers who are going to have to go to state court to defend their rights. They have changed the law to a degree historically in the state of Connecticut. They, the Democrats don't want to admit it because they've been getting a backlash, but that's the truth. Senator, we also saw the absentee ballot bill uh, passed just days ago. You sounded the alarm that over 20,000 ballots still had not been sent out to voters just days ahead of the primary. So does this deepen your initial concern about fraud and voter disenfranchisement? This deepens my concern regarding Denise Burrell. Look, I want to be clear. Republicans in the House and the Senate have said because of COVID, people should be able to vote absentee ballot. That's what we said. That's what we maintained. All is good there. What we object to is Denise Burrell, Secretary of State, sending out absentee ballot applications and then absentee ballots because we knew they had no control over the list and they, we knew that this task was very daunting without ever having a trial run. But she went ahead and did it and uh, went forward with it. We have absentee ballots going to people who moved, who have uh, died, um, the applications. Now it's even worse. We got ballots by legitimate voters who are not even getting to the legitimate voters. Now those folks can't go to the polls and vote on Tuesday because it's going to say you got an absentee ballot. You can't vote twice. So there are 20,000 out there that uh, 200,000 200, out there that haven't voted. Um, and a lot of that is in Bridgeport. That's a lot of people. And uh, in Bridgeport, there's some yeah. very close elections on the Democratic side with Marilyn Moore and others and a state rep race where those absentee ballots are going to count big time. And in Hartford, there's also a close primary. So there's on the Democratic side. So there are some issues. And Denise Burrell went ahead and jumped the gun on this. And now she's blaming everybody from the U.S. mail to the town clerk. She needs to stand up. She needs to take responsibility for her action, not just point fingers. And that's what I object to. Okay, let's switch topics here. Uh, you know, before the pandemic, it almost seems uh, like a whole world ago. But one of the issues that we kept talking about back then was transportation, more specifically tolls. And the Republican alternative to tolls was more borrowing, using money from the rainy day fund. But given the fiscal crisis that we've seen with the pandemic, uh, was that in, hide in hindsight the wrong strategy? So number one, uh, I take exception. We were not borrowing more money. We actually borrowed less money than the Democrats and the governor's plan. So that's number one. Uh, number two is we had a stable stream of revenue that didn't require tolls. So those are the differences in our plan. In hindsight, but you were you your plan was to borrow from the rainy day fund, was it not, Senator? No, our plan was not to borrow from the rainy day fund. Our plan was to take the rainy day fund and pay down on debt. So what we're saying is take your credit card, and if you pay down on the credit card, then your monthly payments are less. Take those monthly payments and put it into infrastructure. So we didn't borrow at all from the rainy day fund. 
We took the rainy day fund and we paid down on debt, reducing the liability to the state of Connecticut, reducing your monthly payments, your yearly payments, and taking that money and then using that for infrastructure. That's what we were doing. That's what our plan called for. Their plan calls for using tolls and borrowing. So two different plans. Uh, we had a plan ages ago okay. that did do borrowing, and we moved from that plan. The plan we put in front was to pay down on the rainy day fund. Now we've had this historic COVID uh, and the closing down of the state of Connecticut entirely, uh, and now we have um, an issue with our economy. Every plan is out the window. Yeah. Their toll plan is out and the who window. Knows if, our plan who knows is if out transportation the will? Yeah, and who knows if transportation would, would even come up again. You know, we're dealing with COVID right now. Hey, we only have about 30 seconds left. Uh, last week, we lost a familiar face and a voice in state politics, the death of Oz Griebel. I know you knew him pretty well. What will you remember about Oz, and what is his legacy here in the state of Connecticut? Oz, I, his smile, his sense of humor, and his ideas. And I, I've said before, and I'll say it again, what we're going to miss most of all are the ideas that we're never going to see from Oz Griebel because he would come up with very novel ways of having uh, issues resolved. And he was a great bridge between Republicans and Democrats, but because both sides of the aisle trusted him. And we're gonna miss that. Senate Republican leader Len Fasano, we're gonna have to leave it there, but Senator, uh, it is always great to talk with you and we certainly appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much, I appreciate it, thank you. All right, and thank you for joining us on this edition of The Real Story. Be sure to tune in to the Fox 61 News tonight.